Okay, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Michele Lancione, and uh, with Abdul Malik Simon, I co direct the Beyond in Habitation Lab. Um, the Beyond in Habitation Lab is a lab hosted uh, in the uh, um, Inter University Department uh, of uh, Urban Studies uh, uh, in Turin at the Polytechnic, Polytechnic and University of Turin. Here in the room, there are uh, quite a few people that you cannot see from home, and, but it's good to see uh, many people from home as well. So thank you for joining. Uh, the seminar that we are having today is part of the winter seminar series of the lab. We are going to have a spring seminar series as well. So if you don't know our work, please visit beyondinhabitation.org. You will find all the recordings from the seminars and you will also find additional information about the work that we do. Um, now, today, it's my great pleasure to have here a member of our lab and a good comrade and friend of mine and of all of us, really, Melissa Garcia Lamarca. Uh, Melissa is joining from uh, Turin in the sense that recently she was awarded a Marie Curie Fellowship and, um, and uh, Turin is the host institution and I have the pleasure of working with Melissa um, uh, as part of a project. So I am just going to introduce her straight away. Uh, Melissa is going to talk for about um, 45 minutes, 40 minutes, and then we are going to open it up for Q&A. Now, Melissa Garcia Lamarca is a Marie Curie Research Fellow working on the Climate Just Home project in our department and is member of the Beyond Inhabitation Lab. Melissa holds a PhD in geography from the University of Manchester. She held Spanish and European funded postdoctoral position for the past six years at the Autonomous University of Barcelona's Barcelona Lab for Urban Environmental Justice and Sustainability. Her work untangles the lived experiences of housing financialization and collective struggles towards housing justice as well as the financial and real estate related dimension of urban green inequalities. Melissa is a member of the Radical Housing Journal Editorial Collective. I should say she's a co-founder of the Radical Housing Journal, more than just a member, and has over 15 years of experience working as a consultant in a sustainability workers cooperative, a researcher, teacher, and project coordinator in Canada and internationally. Now, it's a pleasure to have Melissa here today. And this is also a publicity stunt because actually we are talking about Melissa's book that came out in November. Now, this book is precious um, in the sense that really tells a powerful story that is condensed in the title. The title is Non-Performing Loans, Non-Performing People, Life and Struggle with Mortgage Debt in Spain. So it's about the production subjectivity uh, in mortgage related crisis and I really enjoyed the book which is built on decades of research coming from Melissa's uh, engagement with various movements for housing justice in Spain. So Melissa today is going to talk to us about the book and um, that is about it from me so thank you for joining and now we are going to have her presentation. Well first thank you Michele for the very kind introduction thank you so much everyone for coming here in the room and for those of you at home, uh, we're just going to share the screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so as Michele noted, uh, the paper that I'm presenting today, uh, Life and Struggles with Mortgage Debt, New Theorizations from Lived Experience, is based on uh, this attempt to distill, as Michele said, uh, that my recently published book, um, called Non-Performing Loans, Non-Performing People, Life and Struggle with Mortgage Debt in Spain into the sharpest kind of core arguments that I make in the book and to situate where these arguments come from in terms of the historical grounding and the lived experience of mortgage indebtedness in Spain and specifically the Barcelona metropolitan region from the 1997 housing boom and then the post-crisis period in 2008. So I'm gonna to try to do this in about 40 minutes to leave plenty of time for questions and, and discussion as well. So this book emerges from my engagement with the Plataforma de Afectados por la Hipoteca, the platform for mortgage affected people, also known as the PA, in the Barcelona metropolitan area, specifically in Barcelona and in Sabadell, which is a small city, 15 kilometers outside of Barcelona, working class city, attending dozens of assemblies, actions like blocking evictions, occupying banks, 
uh, conducting in-depth interviews with over two dozen mortgage affected uh, compañeros, which I'll use this term, which means comrades. So I came to learn from the movement uh, and the experience of people there in 2013 as a doctoral researcher for a year, and I be subsequently became an, an activist in the housing movement for years after. So in this period, 2013, 2014, when I was there, I also interviewed current and former Catalan housing secretaries. I interviewed bankers that were retired or currently working in the sector uh, and real estate investors. And I reviewed a wealth of financial reports, news articles, statistics, and so on. So the work that emerged from this engagement seeks to deepen critical theorizing around mortgage debt in times of precarity and crisis, and how the financialization of housing and life and the biopolitics of mortgage debt can be ruptured in the context of the fight for more just housing futures. So what I do is I try to deepen more structuralist Marxist and Foucauldian approaches to pol the political economy of housing with the help of many insightful authors writing on racial capitalism and de decolonialism like Paula Chakravarti, Denise Ferreira da Silva, uh, Nanya Roy, Barner Hess, among other scholars. So to begin to give the sense of what I'm arguing in this book, which I will elaborate with more details about the Spanish experience and experience in Barcelona and Sabadell. First, when I propose that when that financialization of housing occurs, so when housing becomes a financial asset whose exchange value is more than its value, more than its use value, this necessarily requires the financialization of life itself. So life and the body become objects, albeit treated differentially and value differentially to ensure and extend the circulation of capital and economic growth. So as, going, as I'm going to explain in detail, differential valuation refers to racialized and classed differences in accessing mortgage loans. When people can pay, of course, this is not an issue and it seems quite inconsequential, but when people fall into default, this objectification is very much lived and felt. So I build on David Harvey's proposition that mortgages are a secondary form of exploitation arguing that just as there's proletarianization differentially in the sphere of production, this also occurs in the sphere of circulation. And I show the mechanisms through, the, through which this occurs. Similarly, uh, when, loans when loans become non-performing, I propose that people are punished as non-performing, although they're not discarded in the Spanish case specifically, because there's still a possibility of rent extraction in the eyes of the bank and from loan guarantors and future life. Um, so in the Spanish context, due to the dramatic fall of housing prices and the requirement to repay all of the mortgage debt that one has, has taken, it's a debt for life for people, which is what has generated such a huge mobilization around this issue. And more on this point, um, I build on this Foucauldian biopolitical analysis to argue that mortgages have a regulatory and disciplinary function to ensure the circulation of capital at multiple levels. And in this way, mortgages operate as a technology of power over life. So mortgages not only serve to regulate a population, so they have to produce now and in the future, which maybe seems quite obvious, but I also say that they argue they ensure immediate and long-term rent appropriation to maintain the homeostasis of the broader racialized capitalist political economic system. So for example, financial entities ensure both extended and continued capital circulation through using co-borrowers or guarantors, Cross guarantors, which I will talk about with a lot of um, non European immigrants, was quite common. Cross selling loans, so conditioning the loan on the sale of other banking products, abusive mortgage clauses, loan securitization, so packaging loans into a financial product that are sold on secondary markets to raise more capital and to extend lending. And of course, then when crisis hits, banks refinance mortgage loans, offered grace periods, or even personal loans. To people so they would still keep making their mortgage payments and these, these loans would appear as performing loans. The disciplinary mechanisms that appear are imposed and self-imposed. So they're imposed by being told by banks, lawyers, the courts, politicians, you sign the loan, you have to pay. The racialized and gender dimension appears here too, especially where non-European immigrant compañeras, comrades were often told by the bank that their children would be taken away if they didn't pay, for example. The self-imposed dimension of this disciplinary mechanism is guilt, shame, profound emotional, mental, and physical health problems, which many researchers on debt have seen in other contexts. So the last point in the slide, uh, mortgages is a tool in the active construction of non-choice. What do I mean with this? From the nearly 40-year dictatorship 
under Franco, beginning in 1939 through to the post-1978 democratic period in Spain, homeownership was normalized first through a fascist project of racial regeneration, which I will speak about shortly. Furthermore, a political economic system was actively built through regulation, policy, support for the real estate sector, where mortgage homeownership was the tenure status that could provide stability and security in day-to-day -day life. So in other words, I argue that over more than half a century from dictatorship to democracy, there was a steady political economic construction of non-choice other than that of mortgage homeownership for people to have a stable home and to make their future supposedly secure. The final argument uh, that I put forward in this book is that political subjectivation, so the creation of political subjects through the movement, through the Plataforma Afectados por la Boteca, the PA, is a process and it's an accumulation of collectively learned practices from below that emerge in assemblies and collective action. The collectively learned practices rupture financialized housing life relations and biopolitics of mortgage homeownership by rejecting the official or expert knowledge and ways of understanding the world. What comes from collective processes of being together in assemblies where people learn not to trust solutions to their mortgage problems, which the banks and lawyers offer them, not being ashamed or feeling guilty or alone due to mortgage debt default, and learning how to confront the bank and demand debt forgiveness and social rent uh, in their flats or elsewhere. So this process of collective assemblies feeds into action on the street, piling bodies in front of the doors to block evictions, squatting banks, occupying banks to demand debt forgiveness, or squatting empty bank-owned housing because the state provides no alternative. Assemblies and collective action co-constitute one another in this way, because when most people arrive to the movement, they're so full of guilt, shame, and really are no state to take action because of this absolute stress and horrendous situation they're living through. So this collective action is made possible by moving through an assembly process that's very much inspired by feminist principles, support, understanding, and care. These practices, uh, I argue, contest the in, in, in egalitarian, individualized relations of financial rent appropriation that drive the dominant model of housing provision at the core of Spain's political economic configuration. So these practices that emerge subjectively, symbolically, and materially disrupt what Rancière calls the distribution of the sensible, which is established by the biopolitics of mortgage homeownership and proposes another way of organizing housing life relations where housing is not a commodity, but rather serves to meet social needs. So I propose this in the sense, and as a counterpoint to Rancière's argument that the political, uh, political subjectivation is a moment or an event, but I, I propose it's a process. Now I wanna share some of the core elements of the experience from the Barcelona metropolitan area, from compañeras y compañeras, so comrades who have defaulted on their mortgages to get a sense of where these arguments are coming from. And I wanted to begin with a historical grounding to situate us. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the housing context in Spain, I think it's really important to underline the massive transformation that took place from the middle to the end of the 20th century in, in terms of housing stock and also housing tenure. So in terms of housing stock, um, there were very poor quality, deficient housing stock at the end of the Spanish Civil War in 1939 that quadrupled in six decades. Also, according to the 2001 census, which you can see on the right in this table, Spain had the largest quantity of second and empty homes in Europe uh, by 2011. And the growth in the amount of housing over this period of time almost tripled the increase in population in the same period. So really quite a remarkable transformation in the housing stock. Although they started earlier in the 1920s, in the 1950s and 60s, informal settlements expanded massively across Barcelona, especially on Montjuic, which you might know from where the a lot of the Olympic facilities were built, as well as the Barceloneta, a working class neighborhood adjacent to the city center right on the waterfront. Uh, in total across the city, up to 20,000 shacks were built by impoverished immigrants from Southern Spain who were fleeing hunger, political persecution, and seeking work to survive in Catalonia. So these migrants were often seen as other by their bourgeois Catalan counterparts and referred to with a derogatory term, charnegos, which has actually been reclaimed in many spaces as uh, a way of fitting in, as a way of kind of reclaiming this non-positionality uh, within the context. So there's obviously this, been this dramatic transformation of the city in, in this area, specifically in four decades, which you probably recognize if you've been to Barcelona. So the 1992 Olympics 
were really key in driving housing and urban transformation, demolishing shacks. The last shack was actually demolished by the mayor in 1992 as the symbol of Barcelona becoming fully developed. Um, and uh, this, the city was opened up to the waterfront through this process, which you might be familiar with. In the 2000s, scenes like this were common across the country, especially in the metropolitan region of Barcelona, uh, endless construction cranes, new residential development. So Franco's housing policies under an almost 40 year dictatorship aim to establish the construction sector as one of the core engines of economic growth alongside tourism. As this quote from the historian Jordan Minambres underlines, as he notes, the political economic objective underlying Francoist housing policies was to create adequate conditions of profitability, to open up a new field of capital accumulation, and to help birth large professional real estate developers and their corporate configuration. Political prisoners who were Republican fighters captured when Franco's fascist dictatorship won the Civil War were used as slave labor in the burgeoning construction sector. In fact, three of the top 10 construction companies globally um, today were established in Spain with slave labor and in recent decades have led massive infrastructure development across Latin America in what can be seen as a reconquista or neo-colonization uh, centuries later. The last point on housing stock that's important to underline, in Barcelona today, similar to national statistics across Spain, less than 2% of the housing stock is public housing. This is, of course, compared to the European Union regulation recommendation of 18% of housing stock, and almost 11% of the housing stock is empty in the city. The second key uh, transformation to underline is in tenure. The pervasive idea in the 1990s and even to present that you hear from the media, from government, from the financial sector, that homeownership is part of Spanish people's DNA. It's something that's inborn inside of them to be homeowners. But if we look here at these figures in the 1950s, over half the Spanish population lived as renters. And then we can see by the start of the 21st century, over 80% of the population were homeowners. So a massive transformation in tenure in a very short period of time. The Franco dictatorship was deeply worried about what they saw as a mass of second-class Spaniards, as this historian Maestro Juan frames it, who lived in what were considered to be immoral, unchristian conditions and very overcrowded housing that was of very poor quality. Especially at the start of the dictatorship, in the 1940s, there was great concern over how to purge the anarchist, Republican, and or democratic tendencies from this mass of second-class Spaniards who were a threat to the regime, of course. The photo here from a, a commonplace ceremonies that were taking place at the time to deliver the keys or property contracts to new homeowners in public housing that was built by the dictatorship is very symbolic of the process that developed over subsequent decades of creating homeowners. So there were two figures that were very important in this process in the regime of consolidating the idea of homeownership. The first is Antonio Vallejo Najera, who's a psychiatrist and who was a psychiatrist and lieutenant colonel in Franco's, Franco's inner circle. He was a proponent of eugenics, which is basically, those who don't know, a white supremacist pseudoscience that seeks to defend, promote, and or develop a superior white race. Similar to fascist counterparts in Germany, eugenics was seen in Spain as a way to improve racial hygiene and to reverse the degeneration of the Spanish race in re recent decades, and also very much saw the role of uh, this to put women in their place at the home and as mothers, which was their role in society, uh, according to this view. So while Vallejo Najera saw the Castilian or the Northern Spanish race as the reference, the idea of a pure Aryan race was not. So he saw the Spaniards, Spaniards as more of a hybrid of a thousand melts. So he called them the El Cruce de Mil Leches. In this sense, uh, he was into what's called environmental eugenics. So the racial policy of New Spain required a behavioral focus to remove the red gene, this communist and leftist thought, and women submitted to the will of their husbands as they should be. Vallejo Najera was a fervent promoter of Spanishness or la Hispanidad, which builds on conservative thought from the 1930s that held nostalgia for Spain's glorious colonial past and thought that there was a need to return to values and traditions from the 16th and 17th century, which were rooted in hierarchy, loyalty, and honor. So this is where the moment, of course, where the white European race was the absolute embodiment of civilization. So the focus on Spanishness was really on these kind of more moral and spiritual dimensions through behavior change and the focus on changing the environment. And of course, a, a focus of improving the environment uh, towards improving the race and building a new social order was homeownership. 
This really came to fruition through the second figure, Jose Luis Arrece, who was nominated as the, minis the Minister of Housing when the ministry was established in 1957 uh, to address Spain's massive housing, housing shortage. He was a very, very patriarchal figure and he declared a war on slums and subleasing. As he said, a man who has a warm and agreeable home does not think the same as a man who sleeps in the terrible filth of a shack. In one of his first official speeches, which is very famous speech, he made the statement that his mission was to build a nation of homeowners, not proletariats. And of course, this form of sociopolitical control is something we've seen in countries all over the world in subsequent decades. So he really linked the provision of housing to maintaining public order and building a fatherland, la patria, and depicted renting as undesirable. Um, I wanted to... Uh, So connecting this more historic period to more recent decades, the Francoist ideologies and policies to stimulate construction and home ownership, where the state sought to create a specific economic and social order shifted to market mechanisms in the years after, the Franco, after Franco died and democracy was installed again in the late 1970s. So several Spanish historians and heterodox economists have connected very clearly the 1997-2007 Spanish housing boom which I'll discuss subsequently to the roots that were laid under the dictatorship period. So in 1980 and 1990, there was a liberalization of land, mortgage, finance, and banking legislation. Rents were deregulated, tax policy encouraged buying main homes and secondary homes. Also, there was massive labor market restructuring. And of course, joining the European Union, the European Commission at this, at this moment pushed some of these changes that were required by the Maastricht Treaty as uh, conditions to join the European community. And adopting the euro dismissed the specter of, of devaluation that always scared investors uh, in the past. So I contextualize this shift in my book, as the title of the slide says, as a shift from Spanishness to Europeanization, which was associated with a shift from backwardness to modernity. Uh, the title of the image on the cover of Barcelona's long-standing long bourgeois newspaper, La Vanguardia, that you can see here, is Europe, the challenge of modernity. Uh, this was published the 1st of January 1986, the day Spain joined the European Commission, uh, the, the European community, and it depicts a modern day rendition of the surrender of Breda, a classic painting by Diego Velázquez, the painter, uh, showing the surrender of the Dutch to the Spanish in 1635, where the Dutch hand the keys to the Spanish. And in this rendition, the Catalan illustrator Peret shows Europe bestowing its key to Spain, right? So it's Spain reclaiming its historic power and glory within the European context. What ensued from this period is often framed as the Spanish miracle. The diagram on the right shows three housing cycles of, uh, where, of increased housing production and price levels as well. The most recent 1997-2007 boom is the deepest and most important miracle that occurred in this period. So in theory, of course, we know that when uh, the theory says that when there's a liberalization of land, finance, and other economic policies, market e equilibriums will operate, right? And supply and demand uh, balance each other. More land available, prices supposedly go down, but of course the opposite happened. The price of land and housing rose exponentially because of the huge profit margins that were anticipated. Um, and so between 1997 and 2006, over 6 million housing units were built, which was more than France, Italy, and Germany combined. Uh, an unbelievable amount of housing. Housing prices skyrocketed to over 220% of their previous levels and one quarter of, Span of Spain's land area was built up. So not only the housing, but also all the infrastructure that's needed to accompany the housing that was developed. From the late 1990s onward, there was mass pressure to buy housing from public administrations, real estate agencies, developers, builders, financial institutions, and mass media were all saying, housing prices never fall, housing is a safe investment, renting is throwing your money away. This is, I think, a common saying in many countries as well. Banks at this period entered really fierce competition to attract new clientele. This ad here in Arabic is from Caja Madrid, which eventually um, failed as a bank and was absorbed into other banks, which I'll speak about later. Um, so it's really important to note that during this period, it, it, starting in the mid 1990s, over 4 million immigrants came to Spain, mostly, which was the biggest immigration wave in the history of the country, uh, mostly from Latin America, especially Ecuador and Colombia, other parts of Europe and Northern Africa, particularly Morocco. So mortgages at this period of time were offered for 100% or even 120% of the value of the home with family or friends or even people you don't even know signing as guarantors. 
As an Ecuadorian uh, compañero from the PA noted, he didn't even need to go to the bank to get the mortgage, as you can see in the slide. They came to his house, to his workplace. Everyone benefited. You get excited and ended up falling in their web. So what was really happening here? The increase in wealth of Spanish households was the story told by the Spanish miracle. But in reality, this was based on the nominal increase in the price of housing and increasing indebtedness. So mortgage debt during this period increased fivefold and Spain came to be ranked first place worldwide for the highest percentage of long-term household mortgage debt with respect to disposable income in 2016, in 2006, sorry. So this happened at the same period while one third of work contracts and were temporary work contracts and 60% of wage earners survived on an average salary, annual salary of 11,000 euros a year. And you can see here in the table, non-Spanish citizens called foreign in the Spanish statistics and women were largely in this lowest, in this lowest salary scale. This reflects, of course, the differential valuation of racialized life in the sphere of production, long existing structural gender inequalities and intersectional forms of discrimination more broadly. The interviews I did with uh, bankers made very clear the regulatory role that mortgages played in terms of expanding and maintaining the political economic status quo. Like the uh, Ecuadorian compañero said in the past slide, everyone benefited in this process and just one transaction, real estate agents could make up to 10% commission and the state received 6% value added tax. And there were billions of revenues generated in, in land and building taxes each year. In terms of the benefits to financial entities, this was explained to me by a banker at La Caixa. Uh, there was total competition between banks to earn this piece of the pie. Granting a mortgage means a sudden increase, not only in the office's volume, but also its business because of commission, interest over the years, plus insurance. And then this is where, you know, I mentioned the start cross-selling. So often these loans were conditioned on taking out other products from the bank. Um, and as bankers explained to me, this was a way that you married clients to, so they would be with you for 30 years. All banks wanted to do was grow and grow, but they did not assess that if a person had a 300,000 mortgage, a Euro mortgage, which was the average price of housing at the time in the Barcelona metropolitan area, with a very unstable job, or if only one of two signatories worked, if interest rates rose, they could no longer pay. Instead, the bank gave them the mortgage and even said, do you want 10% more to furnish the apartment? One of the arguments I shared at the start that life becomes financialized when housing becomes financialized as life and the body become differentially treated and valued objects to ensure and extend the circulation of capital and economic growth becomes very clear here. So I want to give a specific example of how this played out uh, in the day-to-day, -day, which was a very common practice during the boom in granting um, mortgage loans to non-European immigrants. And this was the requirement of cross-guarantors. So a cross-guarantor is where friends or acquaintances, so people that didn't even know each other, that the bank introduced to each other, signed each other's mortgage loans. And this is how a banker explained the way this worked. The price of the home was 100,000 euros while the mortgage granted was 130,000 and the Bank of Spain didn't meddle. How? By making it look like there were four guarantors. It looked as if they bought the apartment with a friend, but they had no relationship or anything, just to balance the numbers. So I wanted to share this as a very clear example of this unequal differentiation of human value that illustrates the technologies of racial finance, following Kirsten Leroy's writing, for example, on bonded life by underlining how all populations can be and are made investable. So the lower and more unstable salaries that characterize many non-European immigrant people in Spain meant that their lives and labor were not enough to maintain a mortgage loan. Unlike upper middle income Spaniards, they did not have current or past properties to act as a guarantee as collateral or unlike low income Spaniards, they didn't have family who could guarantee their mortgage through property that was paid off long ago. So in other words, the multiple lives of non-European immigrants were needed to count the same as upper middle class income Spaniards. Of course, during the boom, when everyone could pay, the cross guarantors appeared as just another bureaucratic step in obtaining the mortgage. But when crisis hit and the main mortgage holder was unable to pay, the financial entity pursued the outstanding debt from guarantors, creating a tsunami effect of default, foreclosure, and eviction. And these actions acting as a security apparatus for the financial entities to cover the contingencies of life and ensure capital circulation to maintain the order. So with the burst of the real estate bubble, unemployment began to skyrocket. On average, it was 24%. With non-European immigrants, it rose to 50%. And many households were unable to pay their mortgage. Over half a million foreclosures took place from 2008 to 2014, and 378,000 evictions were ordered. Again, what I noticed at the beginning that I think is important to underline is that 
In Spain, the mortgage legislation stipulates that once the bank auctions a home, the former owner is still liable for the outstanding debts, including the interest and legal cost. So uh, housing prices fell on average 69% from 2008 to 2014. Hundreds of thousands of mortgage households were left with a debt for life upon foreclosure because the sale price of the home was far below the actual value of the original mortgage. When the crisis hit, over half of the existing financial entities were on the brink of collapse. Over 63 billion euros in public funds from European and Spanish taxpayers were used to bail out the financial system. Most of the entities you can see on the outside of this ring uh, were bailed out and merged with others with stronger banks buying bailed out ones for next to nothing. For example, BBVA, which is a huge bank in Spain now, bought Unim for one euro and had all of their assets um, for one euro. As of today, there are six major banks that capture 70% of the Spanish market. And the assets of rescued financial entities were either shifted into public private asset management company, the Sareb, the bad bank known as the Sareb, or they were sold to private investors. What about compañeros? What happened to them in this process? Unemployment was al almost always the trigger for non-payment, as was rig rising interest rates, which increased monthly mortgage installments they were unable to pay. Government, government measures on financial entities to um, support defaulting households were all voluntary and also excluded the majority of the population. So when compañeras went to the bank, they were offered, the most common thing that happened is that they were offered to refinance their mortgage or a grace period where they would not pay for two years and then start to pay after. For banks, this meant that the loan still looked like it was performing in their accounting. For people, it meant they got, they got even more indebted uh, because when the time period elapsed, they could not pay. So this Equatorian compañera explained it to me very clearly. She said, I did not want to stop paying. It's difficult for you to accept what's happening. I said to my husband, look, you're going to find work. I'm going to keep going with the 800 euros I earn. We had to pay 600 euros a month after refinancing. My husband said, but it's 600 euros. We're left with 200 for the rest of the month. Then comes Mamouni says, I don't know. I can't support you because we don't have enough to eat, either the mortgage or we live. So when this compañera went back to the bank, they offered her a grace period for two years where she did, they didn't pay at all. And they said, when your husband find work, you'll start paying again. They extended the mortgage 20 more years because she was young. So now she had a 50 year mortgage. Uh, and then when this refinancing agreement or grace period ended, they found that their payments were 1,300 euros, 1,400 euros. So they were just completely unable to, to face this. And again, fell into default and were even more heavily indebted than before. In this period of facing default, foreclosure and eviction, the disciplinary dimensions of biopolitics of mortgage debt become very clear, both imposed externally by banks, the courts telling people to pay, you signed, you have to pay, it's your problem. And they were also self-imposed through feelings of guilt, fear, shame of failing to pay. This is an interview with uh, two Equatorian compañeras that shows this process very well. Above all, the bank debt collectors destroy one morally and physically because you could become terrible and nervous. For example, I didn't know what to do. I walked dimwitted down the street, not knowing what to do because receiving phone calls, being told you have to pay, you can't sleep. You can't answer the phone. You become afraid of everything. With my friend who was turned into a mortgage co-signatory in her signing, we were classmates in school and we've become enemies. We're no longer have a good relationship because she says, get me out of this. Psychologically, the bank debt collectors make you bitter because now I'm nervous, sick from stress my stomach, everything, always distressed, you can't sleep. I uh, finished my life here, leaving our work, all the money that we save stays here. And they say the lost years. Interactions with banks was often where non-European immigrants openly experienced being the others of Europe. Uh, so not part of the white European normalcy where women in particular face threats to their family, where their reproductive and caring roles as well as immigration status was used as scare tactics. For example, a Moroccan compañera told, was told that they would take away her children and deport her if she didn't pay uh, her monthly installment. So this is, um, I think becomes clear here that this argument of loans, as loans become non-performing and also increasingly sold off to investors like vulture funds who came in to buy these non-performing loans, people were seen as non-performing as well. So in other words, a defaulted mortgage loan is seen to held, be held by a defaulted person who's broadly seen as someone who's failed to perform as they should to tighten their belt and to pay their mortgage. As a Spanish compañero said, the financial entity managing the defaulted mortgage classified as, as junk. So what are we? We're rubbish, scum. I propose that these preval prevalent feelings of guilt, fear, shame, the impacts on health are lived bodily experiences of people who have been object objectified 
or proletarianized by the financial system, but fail to be avenues of rent, for rent extraction. In other words, their impacts in the body when life fails to become an accumulation strategy, as David Harvey and Donna Haraway have framed it. Finally, this hierarchy of proletarian, if the proletarianization of mortgage life becomes clear, showing what Christopher Harker calls debt ecologies that were very unevenly in, unfolding with a differential valuation of class, race, and gendered realities. So ultimately, some low income and non European, non performing life, so to speak, is worth sacrificing to ensure the continued securitization of valued performing life and debt. So it's from this context that the, um, the PA, the Plataforma Afectados por la Hipoteca, emerged in Barcelona in 2009, founded by members of a movement called V de Vivienda, uh, H for Housing, which um, came from the larger movement for dignified housing in Spain, with the 2011 uh, plaza occupations, the 15M movement. The nodes of the PA spread all over Spain quite rapidly. Um, there's now around 255 nodes across the country, and in Catalonia alone, there's over 70. So as a movement, the um, movement has these three main demands to change Spain's mortgage legislation so that during foreclosure proceedings, the bank cancels all mortgage debt in exchange for the house. This is called Dacion en Pago, and this exists in the United States, for example. An immediate stop to all evictions where it's the family, home, and sole property. And third, to transform empty houses held by financial institutions, which is about 1 million um, in total in the country. It's around 3 million as of the 2011 census into social housing, where families would pay no more than 30% of their income as rent, which is the standard European, right, uh, what you should pay in rent um, as a tenant. So the PAS overarching strategy is to pressure the administration to implement their demands. And since there's insufficient structural and practical responses, uh, to especially to urgent needs that need to be solved immediately, the PA collectively enacts these demands through action. The base of this process are weekly collective advising assemblies. This is where mortgage affected people first uh, came into the contact with the PA. And here is where PA members explained the three phases of foreclosure, outlining what to do first when a person can't pay their mortgage, second, if you've stopped paying and received foreclosure documents, and third, if you've been foreclosed and faced eviction or have already been evicted. Um, also, this is another maybe conversation for the question and answer, but this process changed dramatically and now in around 2014, 2015, where there's a lot more rental and squatting cases coming to the movement, which has a different dynamic and different process. Um, a process of collective advising um, follows where people explain their situation and receive guidance and support from the assembly. The three main processes that happen here are reflected in this quotes on the side of this of the slide. So first people see they're not alone, which is really profoundly important for, for understanding this as a collective process. People clearly talked about feeling relief and hope when they came, how they didn't feel alone because they were with others with the same problem. Also shedding fear, guilt, and shame. I heard this and saw this countless times, and I even saw physical changes in people who would come to assemblies not able to speak, and within a few months were all of a sudden standing up and able to talk and explain things, which, you know, a huge transformation because of this collective process. And many compañeras uh, underline the importance of the information that was imparted in collective advising assemblies, as most had absolutely no idea what to do and had no information on how to act. Through these assemblies, people understand that constant struggle is needed to obtain debt forgiveness and our social rent, that the law will not give this to you, and they learn what steps to take, how to act, and how get support to do it. So I propose that these collective advising assemblies are places where people unable to pay their mortgage begin to disidentify with their position in the dominant configuration. This is a process of subject subjectivation in Rensarian terms. So through these assemblies, the predominant logic of being a failed mortgage homeowner, a financial subject that has to pay no matter what, begins to be dismantled. Rather than seeing their situation as individual solitary problem and personal failure, people begin to see this, the housing boom in a bus as a collective scam and see themselves as, as an object in this process, a number in the system, and identify an us and a them. Um, this quote from a Moroccan compañera illustrates th this. What us poor people ask for is a house. We're not asking for anything, just a dignified house where we can keep living, working. We're their slaves and we're waiting for them to toss us something like a dog. When you bring it food, it's happy. When you have work, you're happy because you can pay, you can live. But if you have debt and you are a defaulter, you can't even buy a secondhand washing machine. So this process, of course, of disidentifying dominant order is absolutely not a smooth, easy, or even process. And some people don't go through it even 
despite coming to assemblies in the movement, uh, coming to assemblies constantly. Nonetheless, this process of subjectivation is initiated when a person accepts their inability to pay their mortgage and begins their struggle and start to challenge this dominant creditor-debtor relationship and being a financialized subject. So from this assembly as a base, mortgage-affected people engage in collective direct action. The most common actions uh, in 2013, 2014 are shown in these images. So blocking or occupying banks. So these were, uh, could be either individual actions that were for one case. So after a person went to demand something from the, from the director of the bank and they wouldn't do anything after multiple visits, they would organize um, collective actions to occupy banks. Some of them would last, this one in Sabade lasted 10 days. It was multiple cases until they had the solution to the cases. Um, also blocking evictions with people's bodies uh, so that the eviction cannot be executed and the order cannot be delivered. And then the third photo occupying bank owned housing when eviction is imminent and there's no housing solution from the state. So the idea is that since the state doesn't provide housing solution, and of course all these empty bank owned houses have essentially been socialized through public funds, through bank bailouts, the movement take, makes them social housing through squatting. These actions make visible a wrong through an act of equality that directly illustrates both a structural and everyday lived conflict that exists in society. At its essence, the base of the wrong is a deeply egalitarian process and relations of financial rent appropriation that underlies housing provision and circulation. And this wrong is made visible as mortgage affected people interrupt the established order to enact the right to dignified and affordable housing. So in other words, these actions show that the right to housing shouldn't be conditional on extreme indebtedness, on the precariousness of, precariousness of rental markets, or waiting for non-existent social housing and can be made real now through action. This, of course, process of political subjectivation, which I propose as this accumulation of collectively learned practices, um, is not without its challenge, of course. The two main ones I explore in my book are assistentialism and non-engagement. So um, assistencialismo is a word that's often spoken in the, in the movement. And it also comes from, conceptually in the literature, uh, Paulo Freire's use of the word in the 1970s in Brazil's colonial context to depict treating a person as an object, not a subject, and uh, something that debases popular participation in a historical process. So assistentialism uses gestures and attitudes that encourage passivity, right? So people don't become active subjects. When it's used by the PA, uh, the term portrays how social service providers regard people as clients and focus on the symptoms rather than the root causes of problems. The term is often used by the PA to say what it's not because they've always very much been against these kind of assistentialist approaches to solve some of these cases when they come to the movement. But in 2013, 2014, the collective negotiation project that, that um, process that was developed led to this emergence of assistentialism. So when the PA started, mortgage affected people fought to resolve their own case by going to the bank directly, getting support from the PA through gaining knowledge and support in assemblies and people would accompany you to go talk to the bank director. So it was, it was an individual process that was supported by the collective. Um, but what happened? Um, and here the focus was social and political struggle where people escalated pressure on the bank and acted as their own negotiator. But because of the enormous growth in defaults and also the PA had so much success in getting people debt forgiveness through these actions, they started to develop this collective negotiation process. So here one person in the movement was assigned as an interlocutor for a bank. And some PAs like in Barcelona, they held meetings on separate days for people. So if you had a mortgage with La Caixa, you would go to the meeting on Tuesday because your interlocutor who would speak with a debt collector was there. And then you would go with other people from the same, who had the mortgage from the same bank. So what happened, it started to fragment a collective process. Um, and some people started to see interlocutors as people who can solve their cases because they have meetings directly with uh, the debt recuperators at the bank where they had their mortgage loans. So this basically a position of power emerged in this figure. And some cases had assistentialist tendencies because these people would kind of take charge of other people's cases uh, and help them, even though this was supposed to not be done. So the way that this emerged is reflected in this quote from Pakistani mortgage affected compañero, expressing that the PA, rather than a collective struggle, which he formed part of, was more, more like an administrative agency, like a gestoria, which would manage his case that, and they should solve it for him. 
So it's interesting, uh, eventually this collective negotiation model was dismantled because of the dynamics it created in the movement. But I think it really shows the challenges of these kind of horizontal processes interacting with hierarchical status quo orders and ways of functioning in society. So in closing, the paper I presented today, trying to distill these ideas in my book to the essence, aim to share these key insights and theorizations about the lived experience and struggle against mortgage indebtedness in times of crisis through a historical geographic approach centered in Spain, specifically the Barcelona metropolitan region. So I was really inspired by feminist scholars bringing the everyday into contemporary political economy. And I try in this book to connect a heterodox Marxist inspired political economic reading with the lived experience of mortgage affected compañeros as well as the experiences of different people in this, in this configuration, bankers and others during the booming crisis. So reflecting on these clearly racialized, gendered and class experiences that I really clearly saw from compañeras and compañeros pushed me to go beyond thinkers like Foucault, Harvey, Marx, and deepen analysis with the help of racial capitalism and decolonial scholars um, who really, I think, can give a much richer reading and nuanced reading of the processes that are underway in, society, in our society and what we see in our day to day. So in terms of the contribution that I'm trying to make with this book is to think through these not only class but racialized and gendered realities in the European context uh, in political economic processes and in the everyday. At the same time, uh, I feel that my work underscores the need for further theoretical and empirical inquiries that critically assess the intersectional realities of subjectivities, life, and the body in housing, financialization, housing financialization literature. Um, specific consideration of the racialized and the more broadly intersectional nature of this process is really urgent. And I think this is really urgent outside the Anglo-American context. I think a lot of this work that has been developed is from that context. And in the European configuration, it's very different. And I think we need to think about that carefully. And I think these explanations are very incipient. So I'm trying to help think this, start thinking about this with this work. Similarly, I think this Rancerian, this reading from Ranciere of rupture and politics is useful to theorize how relations of rent that operate in the circulation of capital, which fuel the production of the built environment can be disrupted as a political act, which again, I argue is a process supported by this accumulation of collectively learned practices. And it's not a moment in, in time. But I think uh, Ranciere's departure from a Marxist framework focusing on class inequality doesn't necessarily help us advance a racialized or intersectional analysis of political subjectivation. So I think, you know, we need to think also beyond and what tools can help us do this. And just to finish, I wanted to end with this text in the conclusion of my book, which for me highlights a really fundamental question in terms of the struggle or even the war for more just housing futures as we see this war on poor people across the world being dispossessed of housing. Um, it is unclear how the pause actions impact structural, deeper structural and long-term housing dynamics in terms of creating more egalitarian social relations beyond disrupting the circulation of capital into the racialized and gendered production exchange and consumption of the built environment. How can a broader equity-based housing politics that cares for intersectional realities be ensured over the long-term? I think this is a really fundamental question that I trying to start to think through in one dimension, but that you know we need a lot more thinking on collectively to move forward. So, I'm going to end there. I want to thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions and comments and thoughts. Thank you.